Hello and welcome to a lecture over financial literacy. This lecture is going to hopefully give you information what I would like to know as a college student, so I kind of try to put myself in your shoes, and what you might want to know for the future. My name is James Kemper, and I teach economics for South Plains College, as well as an adjunct in economics and finance for Wayland Baptist University. So let's start off with what we're going to talk about. First off, what is financial literacy? Uh, secondly, I'm going to give you some economic terms that I think everyone should know. I'm an econ nerd. I can't go without talking about it a little bit. Third, I'll talk about interest and how it works. And finally, I'll talk about creating wealth after college. And this is something that I am passionate about because I feel like people don't really spend a lot of time on some of the most important or costly decisions that they make in their life and specifically at a young age that affect the rest of their life. So let's start off with what is financial literacy. Essentially, it's the ability to understand how money works and how you are affected by the decisions you make. That's a book term, and financial literacy in itself sounds so technical, it's really hard to understand. So let me put it this way. It's more understanding how to be successful with finances. Think of it this way. If you were learning to be a nurse and some of you might be studying to be a nurse or studying to be a massage therapist or a physical education teacher the more you learn about that particular career the better you're gonna be it just makes sense the more you know about what you're doing the better you are I remember one time I was learning to be a sandwich artist at Subway yeah that's what they called us a sandwich artist and when my first day I didn't know anything about making a sandwich apparently because I thought all you did is just take the bread and cut it in half and put the stuff on there was so much to it and there was a lot of videos I had to look at as far as baking the bread making it prepping everything and the way that you did it efficient, efficiently to the point of knowing how much I put on each sandwich now the more I knew the better uh, sandwich artist I became and the quicker I could help people. That was the whole goal. That's why they taught me. And I say that just to show you that it's so important with finances. The more you know, the better you are. And it's a continual process. I have a master's degree in finance and economics and I still want to know more. So let's start off with some basics to kind of get you started as far as knowing about finances and how they work. First off is checking accounts. What are checking accounts? Most people know what they are, but maybe not necessarily know how they work. A checking account is just a demand deposit, which means that at any time I can go to the bank and demand my money or go somewhere and demand my money from the bank, such as a store, through a check or a debit card, demand my money to pay other individuals. Now the bank is essentially taking a risk by allowing me to have that money and hold that money because at any time I can just access it at any time and I'm taking the risk that the bank essentially won't go under so there's a trust built from both ways and what that means essentially is that I put my money into the bank and depending on how my checking account is set up the bank is going to make money off of that account and by doing so at any time I can take my money out hopefully that uh, gave you a better understanding I don't know if it confused you anymore but let me tell you how checking accounts really make their money they make them off of or make it off of uh, overdraft fees in fact $35 is the maximum amount that banks are allowed financial institutions are allowed by law to charge you on an overdraft fee. What is an overdraft fee? That's any time that you go beyond the amount of money that you've put in a bank. And you might be asking yourself, why does a bank allow this to happen? Well, that's because they make a fee. And $35 is the maximum amount that they can charge you. 99% of banks charge $35. <laughs> so, a checking is account is so vital to financial literacy and setting yourself up, up for financial success that I recommend every single person alive, especially in America, have one. 
my son is one year old and he has a checking account obviously he's not spending any money but he needs that to build up his credibility and you might be saying why does he need it to build up his credibility well if I'm gonna store his money and he gets money for um, birthdays and Christmas and things like that not a lot but I want to store it in a safe place that's probably gonna earn interest but this is not the same as a savings account I want to set it in a place where at any time if I wanted to make a purchase for him I could have access to it now if I put it under my bed let's say that I put my money under my pillow and I go to a Texas Tech game and at the Texas Tech game I see Cliff Kingsbury and Cliff Kingsbury is taking pictures for I don't know uh, Habitat for Humanity and all you have to do is pay five bucks and you get a picture with Cliff Kingsbury turns out I'm a big Texas Tech fan so I want to take a picture with him but I need to go all the way home and have access to my pillow account and get the money so I can come back and take a picture with Cliff Kingsbury. Now I know that that's pretty much a ridiculous uh, example and probably is not going to happen to you but it does show you that checking accounts are vital and they, they ensure that you are trustworthy because you're able to keep the money in there. They're also the best form of creating a spending plan. And I don't call it a budget, and most uh, financial lessons will t tell you that you need to have a budget. I call it a spending plan because it's telling you how you spend your money. It's not telling you how you limit your spending. It's telling you how you specifically spend what you spend your money on. Some of you are going to spend a lot of your money on food, and that may be okay based on your particular needs and what your end goal is. Now, the goal is to keep money in that checking account. The goal is not necessarily to pad it up, especially right now because you don't have a whole lot of money, but it's to ensure that you never overdraft. And therefore, I would say make sure that you are having a sp or utilizing a spending plan, which is like a budget, but it's saying, hey, this is what I'm going to spend my money on every month, and I'm not going to spend any more money on anything else unless it's an emergency. And we're going to talk about where that money will come from when you do have that come up. So next thing is debit cards uh, that I have listed up there and why I think debit cards are also really important. But they're also really risky. Debit cards allow you electronic access to your checking account and at any time it, you can swipe the card and the money comes out of your checking account just like you're writing a check. And typically that's how checking accounts used to be and that's why they're still called checking accounts. However, most banks are going strictly to calling them just demand deposit accounts but what they mean is that anytime I can take my debit card and make a purchase by I don't know a burrito and a couple drinks at Chimmy's and money comes out of my account and electronically I never see that the problem with it is if you don't have a specific spending plan and know how much money is in your account your checking account at any time you can overdraft that account and that's when that $35 overdraft fee will hit you with a debit card. And it can continually hit you with a debit card. Because you can make multiple purchases. Hey, there was a cute girl. I bought her three or four drinks. There's three or four overdraft fees. So if you don't have a specific spending plan, this is how much money I'm going to spend at Chimmy's, and that's it, and that's how, I ha how much I have in my checking account, you are going to cost yourself a lot and that's where financial literacy this knowledge comes into play next the another basic concept but it, it's not really basic in the sense that everybody gets it it's just basic as far as building the foundation of financial literacy is savings accounts most people don't understand savings accounts they just think well that's where I put my money in my piggy bank right that's where I have it for a rainy day it's much more than that because it needs to be focused if you put money into a savings account, you're saving it to buy something in the future. No matter what, you're going to buy something in the future. Now, you might be saying, okay, I'm going to have it only for emergencies, but you need to specifically say, only an emergency that costs more than $1,000 will I put uh, utilize my savings account for. Why do I say that you need a specific spending 
uh, plan for your savings account. So you don't go into your savings account for a $50 sale at Kohl's on shirts. You have to have a specific spending plan just like you would call a budget with your checking account for your savings account. And you might be saving up to buy a car. And if you have only one savings account, you might be saving up for a car and emergency. And let's say $1,000 of your $2,000 was for a car and the other was emergency. What if you had an emergency that was $1,200? Now you have a big choice to make. You can make a few things, but you are probably going to have to say, okay, well now I'm going to take $200 from my car and the next $200 I get, I'm going to try to put back toward that car because that's the first thing I took out of. And maybe I try to get my savings emergency part up higher so this doesn't happen in the future. So make sure that your savings account isn't just, I'm putting money aside, because when you put money aside, more often than not, if you haven't said, this is how I'm going to spend my money, everything becomes an emergency. All right, the next thing is debt, and I'm not going to go into a whole lot right now because I am going to talk about how interest works, but debt is essentially a liability, and that means I am liable, I owe the bank or some type of financial institution money for the money that I borrowed. Now, they're not going to do it free. They're going to do it for a risk premium, which that's just a financial way of saying, or a finance term stating interest. That means that the more riskier you are, the higher amounts of interest or cost you're going to pay. Guess what? If you open a checking account today, and there's no way I can look at your financial history and say, this individual, Mr. Kemper, he opened up his checking account today. I have no idea whether or not he will save money or he will keep a budget or a spending plan. I'm going to charge him a lot of interest if he wants a loan. That's how debt works. And so the idea behind it is not necessarily just building up your credit. It's knowing that you are a risk and you are a risk to the bank or whoever is lending you the money. The higher your risk, the more interest you pay. And I'll cover that a little bit more on the next couple slides or in the future when we talk about interest and how it works. But there are two types of debt. So one is revolving, and this is where your credit cards come into play. And revolving, that means that when you pay down part of your debt, you still have access to more. So let's say I had a $1,000 credit card, and I go to Kohl's and I buy $500 worth of uh, clothes. At the end of the month, I pay $200 on that $500 uh, that I borrowed. Now, what I have access to now is a total of Let's see, $700 because I still owe $300 on what I bought. I bought $500 worth of stuff. I only paid $200 back. That revolving uh, access is, just think of kind of like a revolving door is continually, I continually have access up to $1,000. But if I owe any money, that comes out of the top of that. So it's net. Here's the reason why credit card companies, banks, they love having you take out revolving debt because you set up a habit and with revolving you really set up a habit of hey I have access to this money it's available to me just like that spending and savings account if I haven't said how I'm going to use it then I will more likely use it whenever I think I absolutely need to and that can be such compulsive spontaneous I can be at Kohl's and man their their shoes are half off I really want some shoes I don't have any money I don't want to get charged $35 I don't want to take it out of my savings account it's not an emergency ah, I've got this credit card I'll use it then at the end of the month I pay off that next month same thing happens that's because they're counting on the fact you're going to continually borrow the money and you're not going to ever pay it off in full. We'll talk a little bit more about how that works, but that's revolving. Essentially, you have access continually to it. Now, a fixed loan is different. A fixed loan is where I borrow money and I pay off 
a certain percentage or a certain amount every month, part of its principal, and that just means part of the whole loan itself, and part of its interest, just what I owe the bank. And we'll talk about interest and what it is, but I pay a little bit off every month, and then after a certain period of time, it's all paid off. That's why it's fixed. It's a fixed amount that I owe every month, and the bank will calculate how much you owe, and when it's completely paid off, I don't have access to it anymore. Now there are two types of fixed loans, there are secured and unsecured. Your secured loans are like your mortgages, your car loans, and what that means is you're probably going to get a pretty good interest rate. Why are you going to get a good interest rate? Because if you don't make your payments, the bank can take your uh, asset, and the asset is just what you've secured with this loan. So if I don't make my payments, the bank can take my car if it's a car loan. I don't make my payments long enough, it's a home loan mortgage, they can repossess my home, foreclosure. That's the way secured works. It's actually less risky to the bank and therefore you have a lower loan because if they take your car then they can essentially pay, uh, sell your car and make up some of the difference. Here's where unsecured is not very uh, good because, or not, I should say not very good, it's more risky because a bank is liable for everything if you default. Because if you don't make your payments, the bank can't repossess anything. That's why credit cards, which are also unsecured, because the bank's not going to take your clothes if that's what you use the money for. That's why their rates are much higher, if not three to four times higher, 10 to 15 times higher than a fixed secured loan. Now, revolving is always unsecured. That's why I didn't put it up there. But fixed loans can be secured and unsecured. For instance, a uh, fixed loan that's unsecured, student loans. And there's a good chance a lot of you are going to have one, if not two or three. Here's a tip. Student loans should be used for education. Hence, student. A lot of people will get financial aid, and then they'll see that they have a student loan and access to it and the ability to borrow more and they'll use it for all kinds of purposes and maybe that's maximizing your utility and we'll talk about what that means later on but in reality if they were to look at the benefit and whether or not they should go to Chimney's Wild West to buying a big screen TV not going to uh, really enhance their education so Here's also another thing you need to know about student loans, which I understand that some of you are going to have to take them and they can really, really help your educational process. They can help you better your lives. They can get certain people from point A to point B and have a completely different lifestyle just based on them. Pay your student loans off and make sure that when you pay them off, you pay them off A on time and B, you try to pay them off faster than what the government wants you to pay them off. Now that doesn't mean that you have to pay them off so so fast that you're, you're living on nothing. But the reason is student loans have a high, uh, actually I should say high, a low interest rate and a high period of time. In other words, most student loans, once you start paying on them, they go for 10 years. Here's why. Because the interest rate's so low and they have a huge risk, they got they have to make their money back some way. And we're gonna look at accrued interest and how that works, but essentially or we're gonna talk about it. Essentially the idea behind it is if the government is going to give you a loan, or a bank's going to give you a student loan for you to get a job, and they're gonna give you this loan, maybe interest free if it's subsidized or uh, subsidized and unsubsidized just means that the government doesn't pay the interest while you're in college. Ask your uh, financial advisor a lot more about this. What I want to talk to you about more though is the government is going to have these long terms, 10 years to 15 years, because they want that interest to build up over time. And they want you to keep getting fees sometimes or essentially accrue so much that it makes it worth their time, this risk that they have. The other thing is, what do you do if you default? What does a bank do? Can they take your degree? Can they take your education? No. 
So this is a big risk to them. And if they're going to offer you a lower interest rate so that you can get this education, they got to make their money back somehow. And so that's why you see these long period of times. Now, I don't recommend that someone just be so gun ho that, that they essentially don't make any of their other payments or expenses after college because they only want to pay on their student loans because those are typically low interest. But it does mean that maybe you don't buy a nice car immediately when you get your first job. All right, here's some financial statistics. Uh, this is done by the Harris Poll, which is part of the Financial Literacy Coalition, or I mean, not part of it, that they work cooperatively with the Financial Literacy Co Correlation, as well as Consumer Protection Agency and a uh, multitude of other governmental ag agencies to come up with polls and, and you probably heard of Harris poll they're the ones who do the polls for uh, politics and to see how we feel about the president and other things but they're really good at polling and I really think that their financial literacy poll that they do every year it's a survey where they take a certain amount of people and they try to figure out where America stands based on this population and I'm not going to get into statistic analysis here, <laughs> but I am going to present a couple uh, statistics that stood out to me that they found. In 2014, about two in five adults, roughly 39%, stay within a monthly budget. That spending plan that I talked about, only two out of five people do it. Now, these are all adults. These are not just 18-year-olds. These are all the way up to 80, 90-year-olds. That's scary. That means that 60% of people are not with living within their means, they're not having a spending plan, they're not having money left over in their checking account. And they're having to, they have to get that money from some way or fashion and that's why they have a debt increase that we're going to talk about in a second. But 32% of adults do not save any of their annual income. This is probably the most telling statistic out of all that I put up there. Because that means that 32% of adults are not planning for any type of emergency or retirement. Guess why this is really telling to me? I, every month, pay Social Security tax. Now, hopefully, that will be something I benefit from in the future. Problem is that this is a correlative tax based on to are based on the amount of need of Social Security and how much welfare we have, well, that tax will go up if people are living solely on Social Security. More people are going to live more on Social Security if they don't save at all for retirement. And 32% of adults are not saving their annual income, any of their annual income. And that tells me at least 32%, probably more, are not spending any mo or saving any money on uh, retirement. About 34% of the population carries a credit balance from one month to the next. Essentially, that's credit cards. Typically, 19% uh, carry more than 2,500 in credit card balances. That's a lot of money. And when I was a college kid, that was whole. There were years where I made close to that in the whole year. And I can't imagine having that continually from one month to the next month to the next month because you're going to see payments of $20, $30, and 50% of it's going to be interest alone. So that, that's, that's a telling thing as well. That's a third of the population has $25 in just credit card balance alone. Or I guess 20% of the population, but 34% carries some type of credit card balance. 37% of married couples say that they have been, a, or been successful with their finances or a successful team. The reason why I put this up there is because that just means that we're not happy. Um, that's really sad. I, I don't really know what it means to be a successful team with your finances and what they uh, set the bar at, the threshold. But this question, and I looked in the way that the survey was posed, is they just said, hey, are you a successful team with your finances as a married couple? Yes or no? Only 37% said that, yes, we are a good team. I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, about who you marry and why it's so important, but, man, that is so telling. All right, so how does interest work? Well, the bank loans you money. Why would they loan you money? Well, you're going to pay it back, and you're going to pay it back with interest. And the more riskier you are, the higher the interest. 
That's called the risk premium. The higher your risk, the less likely you're going to pay that back, the more your interest is going to be. So where does that interest go? Well, it goes to other people who are getting interest as well, because the bank has to have money to loan out. Typically, this comes in savings accounts or certificates of deposits, things like that, money market accounts in which you save money and you get interest. Guess what? The money that you earn on your savings account, as far as interest, is nowhere near the amount the mo uh, of money the bank charges you in interest in a loan because they have to make money and they want to make as much as possible. And the more riskier you are, the more interest you're going to pay as far as loans go. That's uh, just a simple but true fact that holds constant. And it, it just shows you that it's really vital, it reiterates the fact that you need to be trustworthy, you need to show that you are good with your money so that when you do have to take out a loan, have to get a debt or get into debt some way or fashion, it doesn't cost you as much. How do you know if your interest rate is good or bad? People tell me this all, or ask me this all the time. Hey, am I getting a good rate here? What's a good rate? It's so subjective and it's hard to say because uh, one person, a good interest rate might be good versus another person, the way they look at it. And it's more of a comfortability type of thing. But let me just put it this way. There's a thing called the Fed funds rate. And the Fed funds rate is the safest uh, amount of interest that's out there. And it's the amount of money that the Federal Reserve loans to banks, and particularly banks that are going to pay them back. Right now, it's at 0.5% or 0.05%. Really, really low. Uh, we went in a recession, and so rates went really, really low for quite a while. But if you add 3% to the Fed funds rate, you get what's known as prime. Prime is considered the safest amount that a bank can loan a consumer. So the higher the Fed funds rate, the higher the prime rate would be plus that 3%, right? So right now we're probably close to 3.5-ish is by far the best, best interest rate that you could possibly imagine. Now, it's really unlikely that you will ever get that low interest rate, low of interest rate, but if you do, the closer you are to that, the better that rate is. So that's one way you can measure it. Um, I'm not going to really get into what's a good rate versus bad because it could be subjective. It could be based on the economy, et cetera, et cetera. But if you want to, you can always ask your local banker when you get the loan, hey, what? how close is this to the prime rate? And if you, the prime rate is 35 maybe 6%, and your loan is 20%, you know that you don't have a good rate. Is debt horrible? Now, this is a question that people ask a lot, and you probably ask yourself, you probably heard debt is bad. I'm here to tell you yes and no. And the first reason why I want to say yes, it's bad is because people don't handle it very well. And the reason why I want to say no, it's not horrible is because I have studied economics, and I know that most financial classes are going to tell you, don't ever go into debt, don't ever go into debt. You know what? If you can change your life and your family's outcome by going into just a little bit of debt to get an education, and you've impacted your earnings power for the rest of your life, who am I to tell you to not do that? Now, if you're going to just buy some shoes off a credit card, that's probably where it gets into the, yeah, it's kind of bad, or horrible, if you will. So debt in and of itself is not bad. It's how and what you use that debt for. And I'm not going to get into the specifics about that. You are all adults. You're college students. You understand what is bad and what's not bad. Just think of it. How am I using this debt? Am I getting an education? Am I buying a home? Am I putting a roof over my head? Am I, do I have a car that gets me from point A to B? Or do I have a car that's uh, decked out and essentially makes everybody look and turn their heads. All right, some quick economic terms. I'm an econ nerd. I have to throw these in here. But there are good things that help you think about how you're going to manage your money. First thing is opportunity cost. Everything has a cost. Every choice you make is has a cost. For instance, me giving this lecture, recording it, 
I could be doing something else. I could be playing Candy Crush. I could be going to eat at Taco Bell. But I'm giving this lecture. That's okay. I really want to give this lecture. But everything has an opportunity cost. Sometimes they're not always financial, right? Uh, for instance, if you go to class, your opportunity cost, it's what you give up, right? That's the opportunity cost. What you could have done, what you sacrifice. Going to class, you could be sleeping. That's not really financial. Now, it's not a good decision, but the opportunity cost is what you could be doing if you didn't do this. The reason why I like to talk about opportunity costs when we talk about finances is if I'm buying a pair of shoes that are on sale at Kohl's, I need to think, okay, what could I be spending this money on? Could I be going to Chimmy's? Would that make me happier? We'll talk about that in a second. Maybe it will. Or could I be uh, saving this money? How did I manage it? How did I set up my spending plan that we talked about? Cost-benefit analysis. Every decision should have a cost-benefit analysis. Uh, whether you really look into the analysis or not is up to you. Based on the expense of the cost or the amount of the cost, I really say that you need to do a thorough cost-benefit analysis. And what it is, because that's really fancy finance terms, it's marginal cost versus marginal benefit, and that that just doesn't sit well with most people that don't understand economics or finance. What does that mean? That just means, am I getting more in benefit than I'm paying out in cost? Am I getting more? Am I making myself happier? Am I getting more than what it's costing me? And if the answer is no, then you probably shouldn't make that choice. Is it really going to make me happy to buy these shoes? Or is it going to cost me more in the long run? Utility. Uh, this goes right along with that. Utility is just a fancy way of saying happiness. And it's a cost, uh, um, essentially a numeric way that we can measure happiness. And so here's why I throw it up here, or put it in this lecture. If I'm going to say the marginal cost versus marginal benefit, and I'm only looking at the numeric value, I'm not taking into account the happiness that it also brings me. Those shoes might make you happy. And if that happiness is enough, and you really feel like if I had those shoes, that happiness and that joy would would transform me, maybe I could get a job and make me so happy, I'd be so confident, I don't know. And maybe I can take it out of my spending plan and I can budget essentially for it, then why not do it? Then I, I completely say do it. But you need to make sure that that happiness is going to last. That that happiness is actually more than the cost because most time it's not. All right, human capital. What is that? That's knowledge. And why I throw that in here is because the more you know about a particular item, the better you're going to be at making the decision of your purchase, of what you're doing, what your career is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the best way I can put it is if you're a nursing student and let's just say that you graduate this year and three years from now they come up with a bowl of vaccination that uh, essentially will save the lives of many, many people. But you refuse to learn about that vaccination and how much of that vaccination you need to put in the shot to give to the patient. And you say, I don't need to know anything about this. I'm already a nurse. I have a degree. Don't need to know anything else. I can wing it, and then you kill someone because you gave them too much, or you didn't give them enough. Either way, it's not good, right? It's, that's such a precision field that the human capital of knowledge, and that's all that means, human capital is knowledge, is so vital. And the more you know about economics, the more you know about finance, the more you know about how you spend your money, the better you are. A better example of it is, think of it this way. You can gain this knowledge by making a mistake. I remember when I was uh, first dating back in high school. And I remember I asked a girl out. And I told her, I was 16, I told her to meet me at the convenience store where everybody met on a Friday night to hang out. And I'd pick her up there. Granted, I was 16. 
Um, she said no. She said, you either pick me up at home and it's a date, or you don't pick me up at all. I'm not driving to a place that you can pick me up and you're going to essentially get out of it being a real date. Now that was really embarrassing, and I really liked that girl. That was a hard way to learn that lesson. I would have much rather asked someone else and not been so thick-headed and just said, hey, I'm thinking about asking this girl out, what, what should I do? Should I take her out to eat? What? Give me some advice. Yeah, you should definitely take her out to eat. You don't have any money? Oh, then make her something. Figure out something. You're, you're going to pick her up at the place everybody meets? Uh, that's not really a date. You're an idiot if you try that. She's going to say no. That would have been so much better to learn it that way than to make the mistake. So that's why I say education is so vital. All right, short run and long run. I throw these up there because banks are going to talk about them. Short run just means a year or less. Long run means a year or more. If you make a goal and it's a short run goal, it should be within the next three to six months or within the next year. A long run goal is to have a job, have a particular job, to move up in your job, to have a family, to do things like that. Finances, uh, finance is just the same way. The financial goals, in the short run, I want to save this much money for my uh, emergency savings account. I want to keep within my spending plan and have so much money left over. Uh, the long run, I want to have enough saved in my uh, savings account to put a down payment on a home. That's a long run goal. It's not going to happen instantly. So that's why you need to understand the short run versus long run. Real nominal, I'm going to talk a little bit more in the next couple slides, but what you need to know right now, and I'll explain this more in just a second, but real is what we care about in finance terms. It's what it really tells us. Nominally, it's just what's stated. If I have $1,000, it's $1,000. Real is in terms of how much money that $1,000 can buy. And we'll, we'll talk more about that. Uh, I do put these up there because these are terms you need to know, but I'll explain them more in detail in just a second. All right, so the three most important decisions of your life. This is a lecture that I gave, part of the lecture I gave last semester when I talked about wealth. I don't think people focus on these very much. In fact, I never heard anybody talk about these in the way that I'm about to talk to you about it. Your spouse is probably one of the most costly decisions of your life. They're very, very expensive. And I don't mean that you're paying them money. I mean, guess what? If you marry someone that's a homebody and that wants to live in a little town, let's say you're from Lubbock and they want to live in Sundown or they want to live in Littlefield or they want to live in Whit Harrell or somewhere like that and you really love them and you're going to sacrifice to live in that town, let's say you are a scientist and you live in Whit Harrell. Well, your only choice of where you're going to work is to drive all the way to Lubbock. Ah, eh, fair enough. Lubbock's close enough. What if it's this? What if you're a marine biologist and your spouse is a volcanic scientist? You got a problem there, don't you? Someone's going to have to give. That's a pretty costly decision. What if you want to have one child and they want to have five? Well, the children aren't too... You could compromise on that. What if they don't want to have a child? Or what if they want to have a child instantly and you want to do a few other things, save up in other ways? Costly, right? What if they want to live in a big city? I gave the example of a small city. But what if you're from Whit Harrell and you're comfortable and maybe I can live in Lubbock? They want to move to Manhattan, New York. Crazy, right? Uh, I'm going to talk more about that in a second. But where you work, this is the other thing that I'm going to talk about. This is a very important thing. It's not the same as what you do. So many people get confused. Uh, where you live, this is also really important. I forgot about this a lot. I got so caught up in the spouse thing, I forgot to tell you more about this. So choose wisely. Wisely, Should I get married or not? It comes with limitations. You can't move if your spouse says, no, I'm not moving. Uh, your budget constraint is split in two. In other words, your income, the amount of money you make, has to be divided up over two people. Guess what? It can also be doubled because you can both make money. And guess what else? You might not have the same expenses multiple times. My wife and I don't have two mortgage payments. It doesn't make any sense. We live in the same house. 
uh, we get to sp spread that expense over two people just like we uh, have to uh, spread our income over two people well not all of the expenses are doubled some of them are um, my wife has a car and I have a car we both have insurance you're legally supposed to have insurance uh, we both have gas we drive we have various things we have cell phones all of these are split or not split into they're doubled there are also a lot of tax benefits um, if you get married the government's gonna give you a tax benefit for that they're also gonna give you a lower tax rate because they want and this is written a long time in the tax code don't don't ask me why it hasn't been updated but they want you to essentially go forth and multiply I'm not gonna get into the specifics of that essentially the more people we have the more you make and money and the more taxes we have and we keep our economy going right and keep jobs opening up and etc cetera, etc cetera, replace people and that's why the tax benefits were essentially set up but also with children if, if you have more children and the way you spend your money you get more benefits if you're married actually than if you're just single there are some but there are not many if you're single alright so what about staying single is that even a good thing and is it costly or cheaper some people might say it's cheaper but there, there are better benefits with it guess what you have no limitations you want to move to New York move to New York you want to move to Whit Harrell you move to Whit Harrell I don't you don't have to ask your spouse if you're single right your budget constraint is yours and yours alone in other words you can spend the money you can make the money however you want problem is you don't have anybody else to help you make money it's all up to you but you get to decide how you spend your money downfall no tax benefits now I'm not saying you should get married based on tax benefits but I want people to know, know about them because a lot of people don't know that you actually do get some tax benefits uh, if you stay single the government just doesn't like single people for whatever reason <laughs> they don't give tax benefits there's a higher marginal tax if you're single it's just a fact alright where you work this is not the same thing as what you do so many people say that uh, I'm gonna be an engineer that's all that matters right well, what if I'm gonna be an engineer and I'm going to work at NASA or I guess NASA is kind of defunct now what if I'm gonna work in this, uh, computer industry in California Silicon Valley making a lot of money life is good maybe I'm working for Google or Facebook oh just incredible or what if I am working in the construction business in sub-saharan Africa for a missionary uh, evangelist or something like that private industry that doesn't have any money I get sick all the time man that's not why I'm doing it obviously but I have the same job or kind of the same job I'm an engineer right or what if what if I'm a teacher and I'm an elementary teacher and I decide to work in Dallas a huge elementary school probably making more money than if I decide to work at a private Christian school that's barely staying open that's begging for people to make money or donate money right where you work there are other things that affect this so it's not just money other factories or factors to include opportunity costs what you give up guess what uh, some people give up a lot of money to be teachers and the great thing is that they have a lot of time off <laughs> I would love to be a physical education teacher and I'm not downplaying it I would really like to be one because I feel like you just play and this is probably not true and I'm not trying to belittle it but I feel like you just play games and then in the summer you just can do whatever you want you play games during the school year and in the summer you work on your dodgeball skills so you can do that in the school year right well the opportunity cost is hey I might be working in the oil in field or oil industry and making a lot of money but I never see my family I'm working 24 7 and I'm never home what about the possibility to move up uh, that has nothing to do with whether I'm an engineer or I'm a doctor or whatever if I go to a place that I can't move up and maybe that's my goal I'm kind of limited right so deciding where you work is so important and we don't make any decision on that we just like well whatever I get a job it's great or whoever pays me the most that's the best thing 
Benefits. This is another thing that I had no idea about when I was a kid or a child. A child when I was 19, 20, 25, trying to make a decision. What's my career? I didn't care about benefits. How much am I getting paid? That's what I care about. It's not just health, is too. It's not just health insurance. How much vacation time do I have? Do I have to work weekends? Do I get to uh, take the technology home? Do I get a laptop that I get to use for personal use, a cell phone? Um, do I have to provide my own cell phone? All these are benefits, right? <clears throat> One of the cool things that's starting to come with the new health care act and we can get in a whole debate over the health care act but i'm not going to go there but one of the good things if there are any benefits this is one of them a lot of new wellness plans are getting implemented that come with things like uh, deductions for gym memberships and anything that's active if you're going on hiking trips and camping trips and doing things that are active they're going to give you some money. Why? Because they want you healthier and therefore lowering their costs. That's a pretty cool benefit if I'm a health nut and I work out in the gym all the time, right? If I'm someone who doesn't care about that, and actually I'm not really a health nut, so if you gave me a gym membership at this company, I probably wouldn't be like, oh, that's a cool benefit. But if I did, that's one. Culture. No one ever asks about culture. No one says, hey, what is it like to work there? Whenever you interview for a job, Go around and ask people about, hey, what is it like to work there? People that are doing the job, not just the manager. The manager wants you to work there. They can tell you it's awesome, it's incredible. But ask other people in your office. Say, hey, do you, do you like, honestly, do you like working here? If they say, man, they pay a lot of money, but it sucks. I hate it. If I could find anything else, I would. You probably don't want to work there. The culture is so important. It's imperative. People don't ever take that into factor. If you're a happy person and like to talk and the culture is really dismal and no one wants to talk and it's boring, it's going to suck for you, right? Uh, maybe they have a happy hour at Chimmy's every Friday. Well, probably not Chimmy's because that's not <laughs> where <laughs> people who are career oriented would be. Uh, maybe they have a happy hour at a better place, but that's a whole other topic as well. But... Uh, Whatever it is, maybe you like that. Or maybe you don't. Maybe you just want to work and work and work and leave work there. If you like that culture, that's for you, right? Ask about that so you get a good fit. All right, where you live? State, city, etc. Not every state and city are equal when it comes to wealth. Guess what? If I were to work in a different state, I'd probably get a lot more in income. Here's where the real nominal is going to come into play. But it doesn't really matter if I get paid a whole lot and have a lot of taxes. Because, and this is the best way to put it, Texas, all I have is my federal income tax. Now you can say I have my uh, sales tax, but that's whenever I buy something. As far as income's uh, concerned, my check, only the federal taxes come out of it. So hypothetically, if I was getting paid $60,000 in Texas, and let's say a hundred thousand dollars in New York, my sixty thousand, the only thing that would come out of it would be federal income taxes. Hundred thousand dollars in New York, I would have my federal income taxes, my state New York taxes, and then my city taxes. That's a lot of taxes. And also within that are price levels and this is where my real versus nominal comes into play and real equals purchasing power I talked about that earlier but didn't go into detail this is how much you can buy guess what New York is really costly it's expensive I have to get on a cab and it costs sixty dollars to go to work I don't even know how much cabs cost it's real expensive I have to wait three hours just to get there oh, man this is horrible or I can drive to work in 10-15 minutes and it's not very expensive homes are much cheaper my income's less but real is more important it's how much money you can or how much you can buy with the money you make nominal is just the dollar amount dollar amount doesn't mean anything it just means that hey I'm getting paid 80,000 you're getting paid 60 
I'm making twenty thousand dollars more than you. Really? Well, you pay three or four times what I pay in taxes and in housing costs. Real is really imperative here. City versus rural. So a lot of people, uh, when they when they look at where they live, it's more of, hey, this is what I grew up around. I get that. I get that completely. And or, hey, I want to live. Um, in a place where I get paid a lot, like I just said, but they don't look at what comes with that. And maybe they look at, hey, if I get paid a lot, that means I have to drive through traffic and rush hour and it takes me two hours to get to work in Houston. That sucks. Or maybe I live in Littlefield, Texas, and it takes me 60 seconds to get where I work. Also, if I live in Littlefield, Texas, and I'm a scientist, and I may be working at Allsup's because there is not a lot of uh, demand or jobs for scientists there. So you got to look at the whole aspect of city versus rural, and you also have to realize a few things that just because it's one way now, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be that way forever. A good example of this is South Lubbock population boom has gone out that way, right? I may move out there because it's rural now, but it's not going to be that way forever. So when I'm making these financial decisions, I have to look in the long run versus just the short run. Here's some financial tools. This is the last thing I'm going to talk about because that's what you really, really wanted, things that can help you. Uh, one of my favorite things is the rule of 70. This tells you how long it takes to double your investments, your salaries based on a percentage. For example, and all you do is you take 70 divided by an interest rate, and it's a percentage interest rate, so it's simple math. That's why it's one of my favorite things. So let's say you got a 3% raise every year, or a 3% in interest every year, and you take 70 divided by 3, and that comes out to 23.33 years. That's how long it takes to double your income. So let's say that I was making $20,000 a year, and right now it would take 23.33 years to make 40000 Or if I was saving and I had $20,000 saved up, it would take 23 years for that $20,000 to become 40000 That's where compounding comes into play and the way it works is your interest gets compounded on, on itself, it gets added back in and then you recalculate. That formula is a little more tricky. This rule of 70 is just really cool and I, I like using it. A uh, more accurate measure is in number of years, and this is for people who really want to calculate how much interest they'll have and how much it's going to cost them for something. What you take is your investment, that's the I that you can see on your screen, the I plus R in, uh, or into the number. Let me see if I can get my little pointer out right here. So I take my I. And plus, and this is investment, say I have $1,000, and then I take my rate at 3% to the N. Well, what it tells me, and then I times this by the number of years that I'm going times 100%, is that, for example, at 3% in 20 years, your investment salary would be 180% of what you put in. In other words, if I had $1,000 in 20 years, I would have $1,800 or $1, in 20 years. This one's a little bit more comp complicated, but it's really good because it gives you pretty accurate of how much money you'll have or how much money you'll pay. Let's say my interest rate, and this is how long it's going to take me to pay it off, is 20 years. Um, in other words, I would pay roughly $1,800 in debt in my whole $800 essentially at a rate of just 3% that's a low rate this is where your student loans come into play it takes forever for you to pay it off therefore you pay almost double what it is because it's a low rate but it's over a long period of time alright I hope you enjoyed the lecture that I gave today um, if you have any questions please ask your teacher and if you have any specific questions for me you can ask your teacher to ask me Thank you and have a nice day.